that up here. Okay, so um, I've, I've updated your uh, I updated your attendance grades at least on Friday. They're up to date on on Blackboard. I'll upload your attendance grades today, which I won't be able to do unless I pass around the attendance sheet. So maybe I ought to do that. I'm sitting here thinking, you're like, uh, Dr. Mike. We need the attendance sheet. Um, so homework six is graded and returned. Uh, homework seven, that's due today. If you have not put that up here, please do so, like, right now. Um, the solution's on Blackboard so that you have that. Uh, before we get into the exam review, something I thought I'd go ahead and mention. Uh, Marshall's doing, uh, uh, engaging in a program called a week of teaching visits. Uh, it's like an open classroom thing where uh, folks are opening their classroom for other folks to come in and visit. Uh, I went ahead and put us down for Friday, April 6th, so we might have some visitors come in to just learn about development link. So um, <laughs> that's what we're talking about that day. So um, if, if you're here and you see, like I already know I've got, I should have at least one professor coming, uh, but if you look and you see that like there's a professor, like what are they doing here? Now you know what they're doing. So, um, but yeah, that's on Friday. So I just thought I'd give you a heads up now. So, so that you're aware. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about exam two. I'm going to give you all uh, a chance to ask whatever questions uh, are on your mind. And uh, so let's just sort of jump right into it. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's talk about exam two. Again, this is all uh, online. This is all on Blackboard, so this, this, everything that you see here uh, is available. Okay, so let's talk about exam two. So exam two, uh, closed book, closed notes, y'all know the drill. Um, you can use a calculator and a formula sheet. Put whatever you want on the formula sheet except for worked out examples. Y'all know my, my reasons why. I mean, if you start getting married into those particular uh, uh, examples, you'll start transferring values and it ends up not working well for you. Now, the yellow box over here is what the exam covers. Lecture notes 10 through 11, and then homeworks uh, 6 through 7. Not on the exam. Remember, I'm not putting T-beams and doubly reinforced beams on the exam, so I'm not putting uh, homework 5 or those lecture notes. I'm telling you that right now. There will... <laughs> all right, all right. Okay. Now, now I'm, I'm going to say this you know, loud and clear. Try and be here on time. If everybody is here, we will start the exam at 9.55 a.m., okay? But everybody's got to be here, so be here. Be here early, and then we can start the exam. I'll have scratch paper for you. I'll have staplers for you. And also, any like beam analysis aids that I, th I think are necessary, you will have. And what I mean by that is I'm not going to make you reproduce your time-dependent factor chart. I'm not going to make you reproduce uh, rebar size charts or anything like that. Um, I'm not going to provide, you know, obviously everything. Like, I'm not going to give you the entirety of this. You don't need the entirety of this thing for the exam. But um, you do need, uh, uh, you know, time-dependent. If you, if you need time-dependent factor charts, if you need rebar sizes, things like that, you're going to get that. So please don't waste space in your formula sheet with stuff like that. Um, here's the topic. So uh, the topics are actually pretty contained because it's only on one page or one slide. So shear analysis and design, um, make sure that you can generally describe, you know, the mechanics of shear, you know, cracking, you know, behavior under shear, et cetera. Make sure you can compute the capacity of beams when they are subjected to shear, so, you know, PVN, PVC, PVS, things like that. Make sure that you can construct shear diagrams. You know, I would argue that this exam is going to rely a little more heavily on CE312 than the last one because you have to actually draw the shear diagram. You have to remember how to do that. Remember point loads, sudden drop, distributed loads, you got the gradual drop. You need to make sure that you are aware of that. And make sure that you can determine required stirrup spacings, you know, lay out your stirrups for whatever shears are being applied. As for serviceability, make sure that you can identify the reasons for serviceability limits. Why the heck do we even check this stuff? Make sure that you can compute effective moments of inertia. Now, now remember, effective moments of inertia, that includes the computation of a cracking moment, a gross moment of inertia, and a cracked or a transformed moment of inertia. So you've got to be able to do that as well. I don't like for exams to be comprehensive, but that stuff does kind of bleed over, so you kind of need to know how to do that too. 
And make sure that you can compute deflections not only based on instantaneous effects, but, long, but uh, long-term effects uh, as well. As for uh, relevant formulas, so I've got shear formulas. So VVN's got to be greater than or equal to VU. So how do we calculate VN? It's VC plus VS. Our resistance factor, our strength factor, phi is always 0.75 for shear. Uh, for concrete, it's 2 lambda BWD square root of FC prime to determine the uh, concrete's capacity in shear. For the steel's capacity in shear, it's AV times FY times the number of stirrups per beam depth, so D over S. Um, <coughs> now the regions for the shear diagram, remember we have three regions. We have anywhere that the um, shears are larger than VVC, anywhere that they're smaller than half of VVC, and everywhere in between. Now the design formulas. Um, this one's obviously going to be pretty important, determining S required for a given uh, shear, uh, and S, uh, S max 1 and S max 2, so make sure that you are incorporating those. Um, your effective moment of inertia, you've got to be able to compute that. Now, I don't have your cracking moment and stuff like that on here, but you kind of, or at least I don't think I do. No. Let me see. Oh, no. But you do need to have your, uh, an understanding of how to compute a cracking moment how to compute a gross moment of inertia, and so on and so forth. Um, so that does sort of follow through a little bit. So make sure that, that you're aware of how to do that. Remember, what do we not use when we're computing deflections? There's something we don't do to the loads. We don't use load factors for deflection. So make sure that when you're computing your applied moments, you're not doing 1.2 dead and 1.6 live, because uh, that's a serviceability check, not a strength check. It's not a safety uh, consideration. Deflection calcs. Make sure that you remember you cannot compute the live load deflection directly. You have to compute dead plus live, and then the dead load deflection, take the difference. Um, your long-term effects, you know, you uh, have your time-dependent factor and row prime. And then here's your chart for your time-dependent factor, as well as, for your, as well as your deflection limits. So those are uh, uh, um, necessary. And also, I'm not going to make you write that table uh, on your formula sheet. If you need that, that'll be provided as well. So that's just other, that, I mean, that basically just comes straight from the spec, and I don't see any reason for you to waste time on a formula sheet reproducing that. So you don't have to worry about this, don't have to worry about that on your formula sheet. That'll be provided if necessary. Okay, that is what is going to be on exam two. Um, I am now going to entertain questions from you. Not very. Homework six. Okay, hold on. Let me make sure I understand your question. Are you saying when VU is less than VVC yes. or less than half of VVC? Okay, all right. So let's talk about that specific homework problem because I, what I'll do is this. I think the best way to illustrate what's going on with that particular homework problem is to look at the shear diagram, okay? Because I think a lot of folks saw the shear diagram and it didn't make any sense for a couple reasons. First off, here's the shear diagram as it's plotted. Now, a couple things that don't make sense. First off, you start computing x distances and they come out negative, right? And you're like, what's going on here, okay? Like the sound effects, yeah. like that? Okay, all right. So here, if you, if you compute your x value at VVC, it comes out negative, okay? So that combined with just all the VVC stuff, it doesn't make any sense, okay? Here's what's going on behaviorally with this beam, okay? In a nutshell, you have got a super stout beam that just doesn't have that much load on it at all. That's really what's going on with problem number three. If you compute uh, just the reaction, just, just right here. Now, obviously, you know, you're not using this for design. You're using VU star. But let's, let's just, for, for, for sake of discussion, okay? If you look at the beam reaction, you get a beam reaction of something like 44.8 kips, okay? That's the actual reaction at the end of the beam. Now, if you compare that against VVC, 
you get 63.5 tips. Okay. Now let's think about what this means. This is the factored capacity for this beam in shear. This is how much this beam can hold up in shear. And that's just the capacity of the concrete. No steel, just the capacity of the concrete by itself. Okay, so this beam by itself, no stirrups, no anything, can hold up about 63 kips. Well, I'm only putting a maximum of 44 or 45 kips on it. So this beam is super, super strong. So from a mechanics standpoint, the question is, what is my required stirrup spacing? The answer is you really don't require stirrup spacing at all. This beam can hold up stir or hold up the shear all on its own. So that's sort of what that means behaviorally. Now, that does not mean that you place no stirrups on the beam at all. Because what ACI spec says is it says, I don't care about this. You have to place stirrups anywhere that the shear is greater than half a PVC. And the reason why is when concrete beams fail in shear, they fail quick. Okay, so what uh, ACI states is anywhere that your shear is less than half a PVC, we have to place stirrups. So we have to place stirrups from X equals zero to X equals about, was it 67, 60, I don't know, what is it? 65, okay, okay. So anywhere from X equals zero to X equals 65, we have to place stirrups. Now we don't need them from a strength standpoint, so in terms of spacing, we just use S max, and that's it. So that, that's really what's going on is we just have a really beefy beam. So, so it, it, here, here's an, an, uh, an interesting quirk for you. Let's say that the absolute maximum shear on a beam is 20 kips. Now let's, now, so let's just keep that in our head. Let's say, for example, here I'll write it up here. So this has nothing to do with this problem. I'm just throwing this out here for the heck of it. Okay, so let's just have a discussion. Let's say that this is 20 kips, okay? Or if we want to be, I guess, more technical, let's use VU star. I mean, whatever. Okay, now let's say that VVC, or better yet, half of VVC, let's say that's 30 kips. What's the answer? How many stirrups do I use on this beam? None. I don't put any stirrups in there at all because this beam is super strong, okay? Not only is it super strong, I mean, half a PVC is greater than, than, in, than any of the shear put anywhere on the beam. So what is my stirrup design? Nothing. That's my answer. Does that happen often in practice? No. No, I mean, think about this. For that to happen, you have to have a beam that's big, that's really big. And I would argue it's so big, it's probably not economical from a moment and deflection standpoint. That it's probably so, uh, it's so strong from a moment and deflection standpoint that you're probably going to end up taking that beam and making it smaller. But by making it smaller, VVC and half of VVC is going to drop, and then you're going to start to have to add a couple of stirrups. Uh, so I, I don't really see that happening practically. But did that sort of answer your question a little bit? Yes. Okay. And how about everybody else? Was that good? This is, that's a great question. That's a great question. Any others? Again, floor is yours. I want you all to feel comfortable for Wednesday. So you are using the maximum reaction forces. Yeah, yeah. It's just the react, but factored, factored. So you you do need to make sure that when you're looking at at, at shear, and, and and this is something that you just have to be aware of when you're looking. Uh, um, uh, at this exam, because if you're looking at shear problems, shear problems, you factor the loads. Deflection problems, you don't, okay? So you need to be aware of that, okay? And if you ever hear the term fact, uh, unfactored load or service load, they're the same thing. A service load is a load that hasn't been factored. That's what that means, so. Well, it's not really so much. It's not. It's not really so much overcompensation as it is. You know, you have to keep in mind what you're doing. See, when we're laying out stirrups, when we're spacing out stirrups, we're doing that so that the beam doesn't fall down and kill people. Right. So there's a safety consideration there. 
for deflections, we're not really so much worried. It's not really a safety consideration. I mean, if the beam deflects too much, it sucks, but deflection does not directly correlate to failure. A beam can deflect too much and still be perfectly safe. It just isn't serviceable. And what, what I mean by serviceable is, I mean, you know, imagine th these are concrete beams and the beam is deflecting too much. You might have trouble installing your plumbing or installing your electric or getting the drop ceiling level and so on and so forth. That has nothing to do with whether or not the beam is safe. It just has to do with its day-to-day -day use, its intended function. So the reason for factoring is, is just because of what it is that we're addressing. I mean, shear or, you know, FEMN greater than or equal to MU, you know, the stuff that we did at the beginning of the semester, that was ensuring that the beam doesn't fall down and kill people. Yeah. Yes? Could you elaborate on that a little bit? It's not symmetrical. So, so the question is, um, in a cantilevered beam, would the only thing to change is, would you have to do the whole length? And the answer is, yeah, honestly. But, but I don't want to say, well, cantilever, it's one of those like, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. I don't want you to think that cantilevered beams are the only scenario where you theoretically have to space out stirrups across the whole beam. What I mean by that is this. Imagine if you had a beam that's, you heard that too, right? Yeah. Okay, all right. See, if it was April Fool's, people like, no, we didn't hear that. Okay. Let's, let's say we have a simply supported beam. This is symmetrical. Now, the, the moment that I take this point load at the middle and move it over here, now it's not symmetrical, okay? Because the shear diagram over here, you know, here's the shear diagram. You know, this might be 40 kips up here, and this might only be 10 kips down here. So it's a different layout of shear. It's a different distribution of shear. So if you had, a, let's say this was your beam, probably what would happen is you'd have a whole bunch of stirrups spaced out right here, but out here it would be spaced out a little bit further because the shear is less over on that longer span, so you're going to have a different design. So th the general answer is any time that your geometry or your loading is not symmetrical, then you'd have two designs. Now, it's a little easier on a cantilevered beam because it's just one segment. You know, you're only going to have to design that whole beam, whereas here, you have a, two designs. You have a design on the left and a design on the right. I recognize this is an exam and you only got 50 minutes, so I'm not going to tell you you don't have to worry about that, but I know that it's a time crunch and I'm going to avoid stuff like that. Here's a simple answer. If you've shown me that you can do it once, do I really need you to show me you can do it again? That's sort of my philosophy. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yep. Okay. Anything else? This is good stuff. Is there any other BC problems? Or that's your project? No, there are three. There are three. So this kind of just don't, but don't, the, the, uh, let me, I'll get yeah. to, uh, they are, they are reduced a little bit. It's a test, I know. I mean, if I gave you three full-blown shear design problems, you couldn't do it in an hour if you wanted to. It's not because I would make them harder. They just take a long time. See, and I recognize that. I use my rule of three. So. It's kind of a real-world shear yeah, application type of thing. Let's say, let's say your beam is, you know, it's nothing flat. It's, it's flat. Nothing. I get what you're saying, like nothing's perfectly plumb, nothing's perfectly flat. Yeah. Not really, not really. I mean, you're talking about like slopes that are fractions of a percent, yeah. you know. And then you obviously have your maximums that you can. Yeah, you have tolerances. Um, let me say this though, okay, and, and this is opening up an entirely new can of worms, but I will bring up one interesting point, okay. Nothing in this world is perfectly flat. There's always a little bit of unlevel. Nothing in this world is perfectly plumb either. Okay? If you erect a column that's 12 foot tall, it will be off a little bit. Guaranteed. 
by either out of straightness or out of plumbness. Okay? N no column is perfectly straight. No column is perfectly plumb. Now, you, you got to understand, we're, we're not talking about a 12-foot column that's over 20 feet. I mean, we're talking about inches. But you also have to understand what happens if you have a 30, a column supporting a 30-story building that has, you know, hundreds or even thousands of kips on it, and it's off by half an inch, okay? That might be tolerable, but it's still off by half an inch, okay? Matt, here, here's, here's the best way I, I can describe it. Let's say you're standing on top of a hill, okay? And you are wearing an 80-pound backpack, okay? And he walks up to you, and, and he's, he's not very nice, and he decides to give you a shove. Now, if you weren't wearing that backpack, you could probably, you know, catch yourself or whatnot. But because you're wearing that 80-pound backpack, what's happening is this. He pushes you over. Now it's not just an axial load. It's an axial load in a moment, which causes you to go over a little more, which causes a little more moment, which causes you to go over a little more, which causes more moment. It's why you would get that whoa, 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 whoa feeling, okay? That, that's what's called a second-order effect. Okay, when you know, so what we did in structural analysis, uh, everything that we did in that course, we considered first order deflections. In other words, small deflection theory. The displaced shape of the structure after deflections doesn't affect the equilibrium. In other words, it behaves the same after deflections as it did before deflections. And in 90%, 95% of, of most structural engineering applications, that's perfectly fine. When you're dealing with wind and seismic on really tall, really on, on, on slender elements, that becomes a thing, okay? We can, we'll probably kind of talk about that near the end of the semester. Um, it is an issue that needs to be addressed, but it doesn't need to be addressed for regular old floor beams, regular old columns in a building. It only matters when you're looking at your lateral system, your moment <coughs> frames, or your, if it was steel, we'd be talking about brace frames or shear walls and stuff like that. It doesn't matter for the main guts of the building at all. But for moment frames and brace frames, you got to do a couple things a little differently. So, Luckily, a lot of software packages um, will analyze structures to handle that. Like in, um, what they'll do is they'll model the structure. They'll assume the worst case out of plumb and model that. They'll actually push the frame over, you know, H over 500, and then analyze it. So your moments jump up a little bit, and you can account for that. But that's a... Not for our purposes. For a 30-story building? Does, does Thor own that hammer? <laughs> uh, he doesn't have one anymore, right? Yeah. It's a shame. Yes. The cracked moment of inertia. Okay. Well, it, it was, I'll say this. So I sort of provided the equation in the beginning part of class on Friday. The idea is this, so here, here's your composite, or here's your, your, your beam with tension steel and compression steel. The way that we do this is this, okay? So, uh, so here's your beam, right? Right? And you've got, uh, you know, compression steel right here, right? Okay. So the first thing that you would do is, is, okay, so you've got the concrete and then you've got the steel that you would transform into an effective lump of concrete, right? So first off, if I looked at my block of concrete, what it really looks like is this, okay? It looks like a rectangle that's B wide and X tall, but there's holes in it. There's two holes, or there's holes for the steel. In fact, you know, if I were to shade it in, here, let me do what I did the other day. So here's, here's my shaded in area of you know, area of concrete. So the area would be BX 
minus the area of that steel, right? Then I've got the steel on top of that, right? And the steel on top of that would be a box, you know, I take that steel, transform it into an equivalent lump of concrete. So the area of that box would be in AS prime, right? Make sense? So what we do for simplicity, just to keep this simple, is we do this. We say, all right, I've got a concrete box that's area is BX, and then I've got that lump of concrete here, which we sort of just draw it like that. You can draw it on top, doesn't really matter. So this is BX, and then the area of this is NAS prime, but then we have to subtract that AS prime. So factored, you can say N minus one times AS prime. Basically, basically. So that's where the N minus one comes from. Now what the book does, and, and it's, it's my one disagreement with the book because I, for as many books that do this, I can find just as many textbooks that don't do this. They throw in, what they do in the textbook is they throw in a two right here. And they say that because of creep and long-term effects, you get an added perk. Honestly, that's, that's unconservative because what you're doing here is if you throw in the two, what you're saying is I've got more area, which that takes your moment of inertia and makes it larger. By making that assumption, your moment of inertia gets larger, so you would be assuming a stiffer beam. I don't think there's really any reasoning for that. Plus, uh, if we want to look at this in practical terms, if you were to use a 2 or not use a 2, it really wouldn't change your final answer that much. So I think it's a little easier. Uh, it's more conservative and a little easier to just leave it off. Okay. Now, when it's all said and done, you get an equation for your neutral axis that looks like this. So we have the concrete, the area BX times the moment arm X over 2. We have the steel on the bottom, the area is NAS, and the moment arm is D minus X. And then this right here, this is the compression steel. So the area, N minus 1 AS prime, the moment arm, X minus D prime. So this will yield a quadratic equation just like the last one. I mean, if you didn't have compression steel, you could just take this term, set it equal to zero. So imagine if for a beam with no compression steel, just delete this. And it's the exact same equation you had before. Now, once you get x, it's just a very similar uh, moment of inertia calc. Instead of having just concrete and steel, you have concrete, compression steel, and tension steel. The moments of inertia are still zero areas, so the tension steel, NAS, this is N minus 1 AS prime, this is BX, this right here, so X over 2, compression steel, X minus D prime, this, D minus X, I plus AB squared, it's the same calculation. Yes? Why is the area of the tension steel AS prime? Well, that, I mean, that's, it's, that's this, so. Because, th th think about it like this, okay, what is the total area in compression? It's BX minus AS prime, but then plus NAS prime. So, if you want to treat the box as BX minus AS prime, and this is just NAS prime, you can do that. It's a little easier to just treat the box as BS, and this is N minus 1. The reason why is, okay, again, this is my equation. If I didn't have any compression steel, just set this whole term equal to zero, and it's the same thing. It's less to write down. And the moment arms are still the same because it's all in the same spot. The, the, the holes for where the steel was and that replaced lump of concrete, it's all at D prime. So however you write it, it really doesn't matter. Does that make sense? Exactly, exactly. I need to erase it. Do what? Can I erase it? Did I use a Sharpie? <laughs> I guess I did. You know what? I'll just close this and not say. Work around your constraints windows. <laughs> um, any other? I mean, this is your time. We got plenty of time. Yes? 
yes, because it doesn't really, it doesn't have any dimensions. It's just a lumped value of area. Remember, your parallel axis theorem says that you're summing up not your moments of inertia, you're summing up I plus AD squared. So you leave this zero because it really doesn't have any dimensions. What it is is just one lumped quantity of area at some distance. So that's why you get a value here when you sum. It's not I, it's the AD squared. See, when you compute the moment of inertia of just like an I-beam, just regular I-beam, okay, you've got your flanges and your web. Your flanges hardly have any moment of inertia this way. Like if you ever pick up a strip of steel plate just by itself, it's got about, about as much stiffness as a piece of wet spaghetti, okay? But where you're getting your stiffness on your beam is not the I, it's the AD squared. And th that's why I-beams are organized the way they are. You're taking a bunch of steel and getting it as far away from the neutral axis as you can because of that AD squared. And that's why they're organized like that. This is no different. You're taking steel and getting it as far away from the top of this beam as you can. So, so yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. But yeah, they're always zero. Any questions? We still got a few minutes. Y'all feeling good about the exam? Well, what questions do you have? What kind of tricks do you have? <laughs> I have enough. I have good ones. Yeah. I'm going to tweak it a little bit, but I've made it. I, I appreciate the volunteered effort. <laughs> It'd be something. <laughs> Well, that, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> any questions? All right, all right, hold on, hold on. Shh. You good? You good? Are you good? <laughs> You're good. KFC references. <laughs> if you go to the if you go to the KFC Twitter account, they're only following eleven individuals, six guys with the first name of Herb and the five Spice Girls, so they have eleven herbs and spices. <laughs> Random. I know, but I think that was pretty funny. <laughs> All right, is everybody good? All right. We'll see you on Wednesday. We'll see you early on Wednesday. <laughs>